When looking at an aircraft carrier, it may seem like it can topple at any moment. That's probably because of the weight it lifts. About 5,000 sailors on board with dozens of aircraft. But here's the most delicate question. How does the world's largest aircraft carrier not tip over? Or can it? Before we answer the first question, let's start from the latter. Has any aircraft carrier tipped over? What was the cause? And how did it happen? Let's find out in this episode of Nautical. Past Incidents. This is the case of the SS El Faro, which departed Jacksonville, Florida, under the command of Captain Michael Davidson, bound for San Juan, Puerto Rico, at 8.10 p.m. on September 29, 2015. At that time, then-tropical storm Joaquin was several hundred miles to the east. Two days later, after Joaquin had become a Category 4 hurricane, the vessel likely encountered swells of 20 to 40 feet and winds over 80 kn as she sailed near the storm's eye. Around 7.30 a.m. on October 1st, the ship had taken on water and was listing 15 degrees. The last report from the captain, however, indicated that the crew had contained the flooding. Shortly after that, El Faro ceased all communications with the shore. It soon became a question of, did the ship capsize? Or was it hijacked? But after an extensive search operation was launched, debris and a damaged lifeboat were recovered. By October 5th, the search was called off and the ship was declared sunk. Let's not start the argument of which is bigger between a cargo ship and an aircraft carrier. The fact remains that the biggest cargo ship is bigger than the biggest aircraft carrier. So this brings us to the next question. If a cargo ship can sink, what happens to an aircraft carrier facing similar problems? Yes, they do sink. But the good thing is hardly hear an aircraft carrier sink in this age, although accidents occur before or during the sail. An example is the incident of July 8, 2022, when an FA-18 Super Hornet fighter jet fell into the waters of the Mediterranean from the deck of the aircraft carrier USS Harry S. Truman. The Super Hornet, which was assigned to Carrier Air Wing 1, was blown overboard due to unexpected heavy weather as the ship was conducting an at-sea resupply. All of these incidents, including the ships that sank, gave the authorities reasons for upgrades on the aircraft carriers. To solve problems like these, the giant anchor has just been put in place to ensure there is no problem when aircraft are loaded or taken off the deck. The anchor plays an important role that goes beyond just securing the carrier in its right place. It also allows the Cartier to stay balanced in its rightful position in any water condition. This is something we should all agree is important for launching and recovering aircraft. So in case of a naughty wave, no aircraft is causing problems whatsoever and everyone is safe. Another thing is the anchor is useful to control the ship's position in case of limited space when we have crowded ports. With everything that has been done, arguably, even the world's largest aircraft carrier won't tip over. But first, let's meet the world's largest aircraft carrier. USS Gerald R. Ford. Before this strong beauty, there was the Nimtz-class aircraft carrier, which was used mostly until all was set to change in 2008. On September 10th, 2008, the U.S. Navy signed a $5.1 billion contract with Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding in Newport News, Virginia, to design and construct the carrier. Gerald R. Ford is intended to be the first of a class of aircraft carriers that offer significant performance improvements over the previous Nimitz class. Gerald R. Ford is equipped with an AN-SPY-3 and AN-SPY-4 active electronically scanned array multifunction, multiband radar, with the ship self-defense system, SSDS MK2 baseline, 10 of the Mod 6 variant command and control system. After years of development, the Gerald R. Ford class was delivered in 2016. The Gerald R. Ford class are not just aircraft carriers, but also the premier forward assets for crisis response and early decisive striking power in a major combat operation. Gerald R. Ford class aircraft carriers and carrier strike groups provide the core capabilities of forward presence, deterrence, sea control, power projection, maritime security, and humanitarian assistance. The class brings improved warfighting capability, quality of life improvements for our sailors, and reduced total ownership costs. 
Each ship in the new class will save more than $4 billion in total ownership costs during its 50-year service life, compared to the Nimitz class. The CVN-78 is designed to operate effectively with nearly 700 fewer crew members than a CVN-68 class ship. Improvements in the ship design will allow the embarked air wing to operate with approximately 400 fewer personnel. New technologies and ship design features are expected to reduce the watch, standing, and maintenance workload for the crew. Gerald R. Ford is the first aircraft carrier designed with all electric utilities, eliminating steam service lines from the ship, reducing maintenance requirements, and improving corrosion control. The new A-1B reactor, electromagnetic aircraft launch system, emails, advanced arresting gear, AAG, and dual band radar, DBR, all offer enhanced capability with reduced manning. The Gerald R. Ford class is designed to maximize the striking power of the embarked carrier air wing. The ship's systems and configuration are optimized to maximize the sortie generation rate, SGR, of attached strike aircraft, resulting in a 33% increase in SGR over the Nimitz class. The ship's configuration and electrical generating plant are designed to accommodate new systems, including direct energy weapons, during its 50-year service life. It is a fact that this aircraft carrier is powerful, but will it stand in the presence of engulfing waves? And what exactly makes them float despite their size? Looking at the design of aircraft carriers generally, you can notice a sharply curved aircraft carrier prow that narrows to a knife-like point. You may even argue that the entire bottom of the ship is knife-like. While tapered hulls may make carriers look unsteady, there's more than meets the eye. These carriers float with the help of buoyancy force. According to the Greek mathematician and inventor Archimedes, any object resting on the surface of water is acted upon by a buoyancy force. The buoyancy force pushes upward while gravity pushes downward. As a result, if the object is less dense than the liquid it displaces, it will float. We can say that's how ships stay afloat. Aircraft carriers and most other ships also have sharp prows, the front part of a ship above the waterline. The flat nature of the flight deck, which gives aircraft carriers the nickname flat tops, accentuates the sharpness of the prow, making the ship look unstable. One of the reasons it gets confusing is that we often simply look at the carrier floating and we miss out on the details. It may have a knife-like bow, which helps reduce wind resistance and aerodynamic drag, but below the waterline, the hull spreads out and is actually quite wide. A Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, for example, is 134 feet wide at its widest at the waterline. This prevents the buoyancy force from pushing on one side or the other from below and flipping the ship over. Traditionally, ship designers assumed that a knife-like bow below the waterline reduced drag, allowing ships to effectively cut through water. This, in turn, made for faster ships and greater fuel savings. In the early 20th century, ship designers began experimenting with a so-called bulbous bow concept. An object moving on the surface of the water produces a wave at its bow that increases drag. While the bulb looked like it would make ships slower, increasing drag as it plowed through the nearby water, it reduced drag. A bulbous bow creates a second wave that effectively cancels out the first, making the bow even more hydrodynamically efficient. Starting in the 1920s, shipyards built passenger ships with large, bulb-like protrusions below the waterline. One of the most famous ships with a bulbous bow was the Imperial Japanese Navy battleship Yamato, the largest battleship of all time. Yamato's bulbous bow stuck out 10 feet, giving her an extraordinary top speed of 28 knots. U.S. Navy aircraft carriers have been built with bulbous bows since the USS Ronald Reagan. Bulbous bows are standard on the latest Ford-class carriers, including USS Gerald R. Ford, and will be features of the future carriers John F. Kennedy, Enterprise, and Doris Miller. They are also standard on the WASP and America-class amphibious assault ships and the Arleigh, Burke, and Zumwalt-class destroyers. Ballast Tanks 
While constructing and designing ships generally, the ballast tanks are introduced at various locations to maintain the stability of the ship during the sea voyage. This is not even a new concept. It is a concept that has been used since ancient times. Just in earlier times, seagoing vessels used solid ballast such as sandbags, rocks, iron blocks, etc. These were loaded and unloaded once the cargo loading or discharge operation was finished. This method helped to a certain extent to maintain the stability of the ship and its seaworthiness. But today, it's all different. Today's vessels carry liquid ballast, which includes fresh water, salt water, or brackish water in various ballast tanks. As ships get bigger and the cargo carried by vessels varies from one port to another, water ballast tanks are used to compensate for maintaining the trim and stability of the vessel for a safe sea passage. So if there is no ballast system, what would happen? In such cases, the propeller may not fully immerse in water, affecting the engine efficiency of the ship. The ship may list or trim as the cargo capacity of the ship is not fully reached. Also, the shear and torsion loads on the vessel may increase the stresses on the ship structure, leading to bending moments and slamming. And lastly, the vessel may face issues of dynamic transversal and longitudinal instability. To avoid all of that happening, ballast water is taken on board vessels to ensure safe operating conditions during a specific voyage. Ballasting of the ship helps in reducing the ship's stresses on the hull of the vessel. It provides for transverse stability of the ship, and also as the propeller is submerged, it aids the propulsion plant in maintaining its efficiency. Ballast helps in immersing the rudder, supporting the maneuverability of the vessel and also reducing the exposed hull surface. The ship continually uses fuel and water from its tanks leading to weight loss. And what compensates for this weight loss? Right, the ballast operation. In every ship, the chief officer and master of the ship are responsible for adding or removing ballast water in the ship's ballast tanks, depending on the ship's stability condition. Rudders and propellers. The rudder is the one that creates a moment about the center of gravity of the ship, but imagine the size of a rudder in comparison to the size of the ship. The rudder is incomparably smaller than the size of the hull that is to be turned by it. So how does the rudder turn the ship? Well, the rudder actually doesn't turn a ship. In fact, the rudder moment created by the rudder is negligibly small to turn the ship by the required heading angle. If that's the case, then what is it that turns the ship? All the rudder does is that its blade moves the flowing water to create pressure differences towards its rear intentionally. When this occurs, the ship will move in the opposite direction. While the primary purpose of a ship's rudder is to give the helmsman the ability to steer the ship, another essential function is the ability to alter and maintain the vessel's course. While this may sound like the same thing, it is a slightly different function. Not only do ship rudders play a central role in steering and keeping it on course by counteracting external forces, but they also contribute to the overall stability of a vessel. This is because the rudder protrudes from the ship and helps provide a degree of resistance against the forces that would upend the ship if nothing acted against them. As for propellers, they are the driving force behind most ships and planes around the world. They can drive large commercial ships through the water at 15 knots and commercial aircraft at 550 miles per hour. The propeller of a ship moves forward by creating a thrust force that pushes the ship through water. It is connected to an engine or a motor that spins it around. As the propeller rotates, it acts like a screw that pulls the ship forward. Even as these things are in place, there are other things that the Navy won't joke with when it comes to the smooth operation of the ships. Maintenance and Inspection The ship maintenance plan aims to get the most amount of repair and maintenance work done in the least amount of time and cost. Maintenance activities include keeping the machinery up to date and in a smooth condition, which ensures that the ship is seaworthy. With proper maintenance, the ship has prolonged life and higher efficiency and prevents the breakdown of its machinery. The good condition of a ship is the first step to a smooth sailing. Or haven't you thought of the breakdown of a ship while running on water? Just like it is dangerous for a plane to develop a fault in the air. 
This maintenance procedure has three main types, which are preventative or planned maintenance systems, corrective or breakdown maintenance systems, and condition-based maintenance systems. Let's talk about them briefly. The preventive or planned maintenance system, PMS, is a system that is carried out in specific intervals of time, like six months or as per running hours. The maintenance is carried out whether or not the machinery is in working condition. This is a proactive approach that enables officers to be sure that the ship is in good working condition. Breakdown or corrective maintenance is a method or maintenance work carried out only when an incident happens. This is not an ideal way for maintenance and can lead to unexpected downtime. You must agree that the preventive is way better than this, as this only happens after a problem has occurred. Lastly, the condition maintenance system is the maintenance carried out when the machinery and its health are constantly monitored to determine when maintenance is required. This system requires additional sensors to constantly get readings from the machinery. In a way, this also sounds like a preventive measure, and it's a good one that should not be missed. So, are we saying once we have a carrier or ship in good working condition, nothing goes wrong? Well, the authorities have taken into consideration that when it comes to machine usage, anything can happen. They don't talk, and sometimes you don't see these issues coming. Crew Survival Training Drills A lot of sailors go on board when it comes to moving aircraft, which means not only do they need to ensure the safety of the aircraft, the carrier, but also the whole crew, which is why they have been trained on how to survive. Wait, what would you do if you were the one in that situation? Jump off the deck and swim for your life? Most of the time, they don't want to abandon the ship just like that to save their lives. If you have been in this situation before, tell us what you did to survive in the comment section. One other thing to note is as strong as the world's largest aircraft carrier is, it can be really dangerous for the carrier when there's an attack that is not quickly noticed. Talking about observation, this is one of the reasons that these ships don't sail alone. They usually travel with carrier strike groups that would help in case of trouble. But what you should know is they are not always close to the ship the way Hollywood shows them to us. They stay far away, and sometimes it may be too late for them to come around. A tremendous amount of naval know-how goes into every aircraft carrier, and not all of it is visible when the ship is in the water. These are things you can't see just by looking at a ship. Just think about the amount of money that goes into producing these carriers, the amount the aircraft costs, and the lives of the sailors on board. An aircraft carrier is probably the ship least likely in the fleet to flip over or topple.